Welcome to the Pure Parenthood podcast, brought to you by Pure Baby. I'm your host, Tiffany Wells, and I'm the head educator here at Pure Baby. Hi everyone, we're excited to welcome our guest today, Sarah Toomey, who is the founder and chairperson for Healthy Hips Australia. She's also a mum to Eve and Maya. In this week's episode, we'll be discussing hip dysplasia in babies, including the signs and symptoms to look out for. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me along. Before we get started today, could you tell us a little bit more about Healthy Hips Australia? Because I think it'd be great for everyone to have a bit of a background of, um, of what you guys do there at Healthy Hips. Sure. So Healthy Hips is a national not-for-profit. I set up the organisation six years ago and it was because both my girls had the condition and even though I'm an occupational therapist, I just felt overwhelmed and uninformed about the condition and what to do. Mm. So it started out as an initiative really aimed at trying to decrease the impact of the condition on people in Australia We do awareness campaigns, Uh, we offer peer support networks for parents and we just do lots of resources that really try and take away the the impact of the day-to-day treatment to try and make life just that little bit easier. Yeah, that's great. It's good to know that there's that resource out there now and it's so wonderful to know that I guess you've been there and that's why you started, you know, Healthy Hips. So it's it's so lovely to, to kind of get a bit of a background there. So Sarah, can you explain exactly what hip, hip dysplasia is? Because I think understanding what it is and, and, and all of that's really going to help. So look, hip dysplasia for many years was known as clicky hips. So a lot of grandparents are probably more familiar with that and they mm. used to double nappy babies. Wow. Um, so nowadays, <laughs> yeah, it's changed. Yeah, yes. So nowadays it's called um, developmental dysplasia of the hip or hip dysplasia or DDH. Okay. Um, and it's a common condition and mm. it's more or less where the ball and the socket of the hip don't fit together in their normal position. So that might be because they're growing abnormally or Mm. maybe there's just a lack of growth of the joint in comparison to the rest of the body. So it can range and it can be as simple as some mildly immature hips that are a bit loose and it can go all the way through the scale up to a severe case, which would be fully dislocated hips where the ball and socket aren't even connecting with each other. Mm, Wow. It's quite amazing to know there's such a varied range too of the different types that you might see. So that's really interesting to know. And I think with certain signs and symptoms, it'd be great to know what to look out for there because like you said, there is a lot of differences between the different types of hip dysplasia and the severity. So what are some of the signs and symptoms there? You're right, Tiffany. It is hard. And the what makes it trickier is that it can be really difficult to detect mm. because of the fact that it is referred to as a silent condition. So by silent, I mean there might be no obvious signs or symptoms. Okay. There are a number of things that you can look out for that might indicate that your baby has hip dysplasia, but not always. Mm. So the things that you can be looking out for as a parent is if it's difficult to spread their legs apart. So for example, perfect time is when you're doing a nappy change. So both their legs should really be able to easily open out about the same amount for you to easily do a nappy change if you find like you can't spread their legs apart and you've got this tiny little gap or one leg's flopping right out to the side and the knee's almost hitting you know the side of the change table but the other one's still sticking up in the air Mm. that can be a sign that there's something going on um, in the hip joint so that's a beautiful one for parents to look out for yeah on the backs of the thighs so if baby's laying on their tummy you would be looking at is there an extra buttocks crease so is there an extra crease just below the bottom on one side Mm. or there might be creases that don't quite line up so that's another one that's relatively easy to look at now the other one is a clunk or a clicking sound of the hip when it's moved so Mm. this might be um, a sound that's been made when the ball is dislocating from the socket so if it's loose and it's slipping in and out of the socket um, but there's lots of normal popping noises that come from the hips so they've got nothing to do with hip dysplasia so just mm. because you hear an occasional pop or a click doesn't mean that your child's got hip dysplasia but worth just having it checked out yeah 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 the last main one would be uneven thigh creases so although many babies have them they've got beautiful chubby legs <laughs> um a 
occasionally uneven thigh creases, and this is on the fronts of the legs, mm. can be a sign of hip dysplasia. So okay. normally I've gone through that in sort of order of most important priority to least important. So you can kind of mm. see that those uneven thigh creases aren't probably as strong a sign, but it's worth just having a chat with a health professional if that's the case. And that's that's for babies. Um, okay. It changes for as you get older. That was really interesting, Sarah. So what about as kids get older, what are the what are the other signs and symptoms to look out for there? So it does change a little bit. So as a child gets older, the more relevant signs that you'd be looking out for is a limp, a sway back, which is kind of like when their tummy sticks out um, mm. and their back is curved, and a leg length difference, which becomes more obvious once the child's up and walking. Yeah. Fortunately, um, in infants and young children, pain is not normally present. However, it's certainly the most common symptom that an adolescent or an adult will present with when they've got hip dysplasia. So mm. it's not a feature, fortunately, for our younger kids, but it's it's the, I guess, the overarching problem of the condition when you're getting it older in life. Yeah, yeah. So Sarah, do we know what actually causes hip dysplasia and how this occurs? And then are there specific times in babies when this develops? So the causes are still being explored by the researchers. There's been a lot going into it in the last decade or so. Okay. What we do know is that it does develop around the time of birth, although it might not present until later on when the socket fails to deepen and you get some of the other signs and symptoms happening. There are some risk factors which will make it more likely to occur. So if you've got a family history of hip dysplasia, then you're a lot higher than the average population. The position of baby in the womb plays quite a significant role, particularly babies who are breech. So okay. breech babies have got a very high risk factor in comparison to babies who are a head down in what you call the normal or typical position mm -hmm. in the womb. And the third factor, which has become more and more relevant and there's a more focus on it is the hip position during your first year of life so okay. it's not just how the baby was in the womb but um, the position that the hips in from sort of zero through to one mm, mm, that's really interesting so how can hip dysplasia be identified in babies typically what what are the sort of things that um that i guess health professionals will do to to identify that as I mentioned before, the position in the womb does play a role, but it's certainly, it's not a condition that you can diagnose during pregnancy and mm. know that your child um, has it. Okay. Around the time of birth, mum's producing lots of relaxant hormones, getting ready for baby to come out. So yes. during this process, there are a lot of babies that end up with loose hip ligaments because they get the relaxant hormone passed on to them. Okay. Um, and it does appear that girls tend to be more sensitive to this hormone and then boys so girls make up about 80 percent of all babies um who have um hip dysplasia okay so in terms of then checking the hips health professionals are checking all babies regardless of risk factor regardless of gender and what the recommendation is is that they're checking um at birth they're checking prior to discharge if mm. baby was delivered in hospital and then at all routine maternal child or family health nurse appointments for children and that's all the way up through to proficient walking age so some states will say up until three and a half four would be your last child health nurse check yeah. um, and other states might be all the way up to five so I think the key message is, is that never miss an opportunity to have your baby's hips checked that's mm. what our, our orthopedic surgeon on our board says mm. you're popping into the gp for something if you're going to the child health nurse just ask them to check the hips yeah it makes sense absolutely yeah and look i think the hip checks too another important point is that they are quite a simple check so they're feeling to see how the hip is, is moving they're moving the leg through the normal position you might see them pedaling baby's legs spreading them apart often people don't realize that they're doing a check to see how stable the hip feels so mm. <laughs> i always say just ask like yeah. just say either what are you doing or have you checked the hips mm. because you might not realize that they've done it while they've been having a chat with you about how you're going um mm. which is often the case you know everything's happening all at once yes absolutely the last thing i should say because a lot of parents start to get really worried you know is this another thing that i have to be looking out for is that yes 
at birth, we've probably got it, you know, one in every 10 babies have loose hips because Mm. of that relaxant hormone. But I think what people need to remember is that, you know, after the first six weeks of life and babies sort of adjusting to being in this world, most of those cases actually resolve. So what we see is about one in every 100 babies who actually then need to have treatment. So Mm. you might get flagged for it at birth that they want to check and monitor baby's hips, Mm. but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to end up needing treatment. Yeah, well, that's good to know. I mean, I remember my son, who is my middle child, and he was a breech baby. I had to have a Caesar with him, and and I remember when for the yeah, when, before we left the hospital, they did check him for for hip issues because he was a little bit clicky on one side, as they described it. Um, that was sort of you know sixteen years ago now, but even then they were checking for that. And I think the the follow up visits with the maternal child health nurse also felt that he did his hips weren't opening up as much as they probably should. So. I think just having that experience myself and knowing that that definitely was something that they looked for. I think particularly because maybe he was a breech baby, that's why they looked that looked at that so closely. Um, and it did fix itself over time and he didn't seem to experience any pain or anything like that. So um, it's interesting that you brought up the breech thing. I wasn't aware of that. So that's really interesting that that's probably why, why they did check him and why he may have had that clicky hip. Yeah, look, definitely. I think um, you know, as parents, we know our kids most and, you know, whilst they can tick some of those big boxes, like being a breech baby, as you said, you know, how far his legs spread apart, that's um a really beautiful thing that parents have the most insight for because mm. we're the ones who are changing a thousand nappies. <laughs> when a child goes to a, a, an appointment, depending on what they're looking for, if they're doing an immunisation check, they're not necessarily going to know how far the legs can spread apart. So, you know, you as a parent feeling um, empowered to be able to go in and say, look, I'm noticing these things at nappy change time or when I was giving them a bath, you know, Mm. I noticed these different creases on the backs of their legs and, Mm. you know, they can piece that together as part of the puzzle and go, okay, we've got a baby who might have been breech or it might have been in a, a different compromised position in the womb or there is that family history there. So yes, certainly don't be afraid to speak up. Yeah, no, that's great. So good to know that um, there's those things to look out for, like we said. And, and in my experience, that sort of those some of those things occurred for me. So I think it's good to be able to share that so that so that people know that even though there might be some things initially, it doesn't necessarily mean that your child's going to have hip dysplasia permanently or have problems and need treatment. So that's, that, I think that's reassuring for people, hopefully. <laughs> what are some of the treatments available though, Sarah? Because I think, again, knowing what's available out there, if, if your child does have it, is going to hopefully set some people's minds at ease there today. It's certainly no surprise that given hip dysplasia is quite broad in terms of, you know, ranging from immature hips through to the fully dislocated ones, Mm. that the treatment varies a lot too. So the vast majority of babies will respond really well to being in a harness or a brace and that's typically worn for a period of around about six to 12 weeks full time it holds the legs out um, in a spread leg sort of like a froggy position Mm. and then that's sometimes more often than not followed by a period of time where they wear it for part time so they might wear it for their nighttime sleeps and their naps during the day Mm. and that's generally what would happen usually you get seen by an orthopedic team um I think it's good to let people know that, you know, if you get told you need to see an orthopedic surgeon, it doesn't mean that you have to have surgery for your baby. It's just that they happen to be the specialist who treats the condition. Yes. Um, And they will look at your baby and how they respond over time. And it really is, it's, um, you know, bone development is a bit like watching grass grow. Mm. So it takes time for them to see how it responds. And that's why, you know, the, the time frame that your child's hips take can vary from one hip to the next hip one child to the next so Mm. those time ranges vary if you know sometimes hips might be fully dislocated and they might need surgery straight up they might know that those hips are ones that you know um, aren't going to respond to a harness or a brace and they might say right once baby's old enough to tolerate your general anesthetic we'll get them in and we'll do the procedure to position the hips so that they can then develop so Mm. some babies will go relatively quickly through to that stage and again like that is a minority of babies but it's certainly a, a challenging process for those parents and then there's some on the far end of the other extreme whose hips are just a little bit loose they're just not quite where they should be and as opposed to over treating 
often what the doctors will do is they'll say, look, we're just going to wait and watch. We'll get Mm. you in every six to eight weeks. Have a look and see what are the hips doing as bubs growing and do we need to treat? So they don't want to over-treat every case. So Mm. as you can see, it does really vary. Really, at the end of the day, it's just that, you know, if we get it diagnosed early, we get the treatment started, whatever it may be Mm. that needs to Mm. be done, it gives the best chance of the hips responding with the, I guess, the least amount of complications in most cases. And if you leave it, you might end up with, you know, early onset arthritis and, and people facing early hip replacements. So definitely not one to ignore, but, um, you know, there's so many varied outcomes. So try not to worry and think worst case from the beginning. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. And I have seen a fair few over my time just working at Pure Baby, seeing babies come in with the hip braces on and uh, parents looking for clothing to dress them in and things like that because it can be a bit tricky when they're wearing braces. But, you know, that don't seem, doesn't seem to bother the, the child too much. I think it's more, it's a bit uncomfortable for, for the parents to have to do it all the time and probably a bit of discomfort for the baby initially when they're getting used to it. But it's definitely something I've seen and, and it looks like it's, um, it's something people can work with and at least it's a tool to be able able to support them into into that treatment into to getting their hips back in the right position so that's that's great it's us it's it's the the parents it's the caregivers that are impacted the most when it's an infant with Mm. hip dysplasia Mm. certainly it changes if you're an older child or an adult living with the condition then it becomes about the impact on them but in the vast majority of those cases with babies you know our, our kids are incredibly resilient. They don't see the barriers that we do as adults and they just get on with it. And it's, you know, the stress and the worry that we have about, you know, what other people will think or how we're going to fit them in those clothes. Like you said, clothing options can be hard sometimes and, and fitting them in car seat, pram and high chair. So mm. it's certainly one for us to be kind on ourselves, but to know that our child is probably going to have no recollection of it. And certainly my my eldest wore a, a brace until she was two and she still doesn't you know remember it she looks at it and she says to me oh mummy is that what I wore and, <laughs> yes. and she knows of it only because really I'm still you know working in this space but yeah she yeah. doesn't remember it enough. Yeah, well, that's that's also great to know that they're not going to be experiencing that pain. But if your child does experience pain, because obviously you said the babies don't really experience it, but as your child grows and say it isn't picked up, how do parents help alleviate pain or relieve some pain for, for their child growing? Or And as they get older, what are the types of things that, that we can support people with when it comes to pain relief typically? You know, it is really fortunate that it isn't associated with infants. Um, but that being said, you know, when they first get put in their harness or their brace, they may be in some discomfort because often the ligaments and muscles around the hips are, are a bit tighter. Mm. So then they're being spread into this spread leg position. Um, mm. So the first, you know, I say 48 hours, even up to a week can be a bit of a transition period for the younger kids even and, okay. and babies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Certainly talking to, you know, the specialist or your local pharmacist about, and you know, things like what they can do from just over-the-counter things through to, to heat. And obviously a, a child facing surgery and an older person would need a, a more specialised pain management mm. um, approach. Mm. But speaking from personal experience, I think, you know, one of the best things to always remember, particularly for your babies, is there's lots of cuddles. Yeah. Um, it helps with both. When, you know, you're feeling stressed out and babies sort of sensing it, being able to stop and just know that, you know, you can get through it together and um, go easy on yourself. So it's certainly something that, you know, you do need to get on top of if, if pain is a feature for a child or teenager or an adult. But usually with our babies, they tend to bounce back after that first week of getting used to being in this you know, different position. Yeah, that's good to know. I think particularly when we're talking about babies there, just knowing that, like you said, they're not really experiencing the pain. It's really only going to be, as you said, that short period of time with getting used to a brace and that sort of thing. And just to, to know that that's not going to be, hopefully, an issue that, that you have to deal with as, as a parent. Because obviously, like you said, having just to get them into a brace and you as a parent or carer having to, to deal with that more than the child really is probably a big thing for the parents to have to deal with. So um, that's really great to know. So a lot of questions get asked about swap and its effects on hip dysplasia. Can you tell us a bit more about that and the link between that? Yeah, look, and we get a lot ourselves. So 
there's many benefits to swaddling during the first few months of life and it certainly provides a great amount of security and comfort. It aids in settling and an established sleep pattern. So it's, you know, something that swaddling is really important for, for parents to know that they can keep doing it and we fully support the SIDS guidelines. However, there has been research starting to come out that's indicating that inappropriate swaddling as they they phrase it, can increase the risk of hip dysplasia. Mm. So the take-home message really is that when you're swaddling your baby, you need to ensure that it's loose from the waist down to the toe so that your baby is able to freely move their legs and kick up and down so they're coming in and out of a frog-like position Mm. that they're in when they come out of the womb and they're able to kick down into a straight leg position but that they're not swaddled tightly with their legs down and straight together. Yeah. And that applies also to your zip-up swaddle pouches that you can buy off the shelf. Yes. And I always say to parents, think it's not a burrito. You don't want your baby up straight up and down. You're looking more at a bell shape. So there's room down the bottom so for their legs to be able to freely move. And all of that movement as they kick up and down is all helping to develop the hip joint and yes. to round out the ball and socket. So that's why it's had a lot of attention about swaddling and, and the risks of hip dysplasia in like the last sort of oh, five to ten years. Mm. Now that's really good and like like I mentioned you know we do get a lot of questions about that as well and obviously we sell swaddles at Pure Baby so it's something that I've had to you know deal with or um, had questions about a lot so I think it's it's great that you've sort of covered that off in a bit more detail there so people really understand that in, in more detail. So we often also hear about baby wearing and is this sort of promoting good hip health for babies and can you explain the benefits of baby wearing to everyone today? Yeah, look, and swaddling and baby wearing are, are the two key ones that we get asked about in terms of the hips. So mm. hip dysplasia is really rare in cultures where infants are carried um, typically on mum's back with their hips spread apart in what they call an abducted position, which is the healthy hip position. Yes. And then the research has shown that in cultures and tribes where infants are carried in cradle boards, which is like in that tin soldier with their legs down straight together that they had a tenfold increase in the incidence of um, hips being dislocated in babies so being able to put the two together they were able to say that you know baby wearing is a hip healthy it's not a preventative strategy but if you're baby wearing in that position that is encouraging healthy hip development you're doing everything that you can to try and really facilitate the joint um, growing naturally without needing any intervention so We always say, please, you know, feel like you're doing something positive for the hips. If you're carrying your baby in a koala or an M or a jockey frog position. Yeah. So many of them. I think I've got them all. Yeah. Um, Because it's great for healthy hip development. Yeah, that's great. I think it's good to know again, like there is so much out there about baby wearing and a lot of people are, you know, there's so many products out there to purchase as well. And it's such a convenient way to be able to carry your baby around. So of course, if you know what what you're doing right there, that's fantastic. So thank you so much for that. It's been great to have you on and finding more out about hip dysplasia and ways parents can get the right support and recognize the signs and symptoms to help treat it. So thank you again so much for, for your time today, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it being able to share my experience and hopefully help other people find us if they need us. Wonderful. So if you'd like more information about hip dysplasia, you can head over to www.healthyhipsaustralia.org.au or follow them on their socials. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about this podcast. And if you like listening, please leave us a review. See you next time.